friends and welcome to Ariel's Twilight Years, how to be a really, really, really old model. I'm in my bedroom this month. Thank you so much to everyone for the very warm response that my last couple of videos have received. Um, at the one about red flags for models and about things I wish I'd known when I started modelling. I did start this channel hoping it could be a resource for models. So I wanted to make one more video about the darker side of the industry. Now I want to say as a disclaimer first, the people I'm going to be talking about today, they don't represent our industry. These people aren't photographers, or if they are photographers, they're only coincidentally photographers. What they are is <laughs> sexual predators of varying types who have just discovered that posing as a photographer or actually being a photographer allows them access to women and allows them opportunities to behave like, well, fucktwats. So we are going to dive in to my top 10 shameless photographers through my 17 years as a model. So many of these experiences were really early on in my career and that's why I wanted to make this video because a lot of these tiresome individuals will target new models and if I had been able to see a video like the one I'm hopefully about to make when I was a new model I think I might have been just a bit better prepared for the range of weird stuff some people do when they're basically trying to get their sexual thrills from something that should not be a sexual experience for them. In some of these situations I think I did a really good job, even sometimes as a new model I was pretty fierce in response. Sometimes I'm really embarrassed that I didn't manage to do a better and more assertive job. So I guess maybe what we can learn from that is that however experienced you are, sometimes someone's behaviour can be so off kilter that you simply don't know how to react and any tool I can give to my sister models and to myself to help us react appropriately to other people's complete lack of propriety, I'm all for. So let's get started. This is the story that made me realise I wanted to make this video because I told the story briefly on Twitter and then started thinking of all the other stories that in some ways are similar. This was a big fashion photographer. He told me so many times at the group shoot where I met him when I was a new model. He'd come along to the group shoot and I could see, to be fair to him, that he was a cut above most of the photographers there. He had his own ideas, he was good at direction and he did seem to have some skills. So he said he'd like to shoot me separately on his own another time and he took me for coffee about a week later to discuss the shoot and so I went along not expecting anything other than a business meeting. Now it became apparent immediately that he had got some other stuff on his mind because he immediately started saying like oh well, I couldn't photograph you like this I don't know you well enough kind of ignoring the fact that he already had shot me the week before and he'd got pictures he was pleased with so it was disingenuous clearly. He started saying, oh yeah, to be inspired I need to really understand you. We should go out, we should go out to the theatre together, we should go out for dinner. And I realised, I think that this is going in the wrong direction. Then he said, yeah, like, I can't shoot you unless I, I understand you. Um, I need to know what your sexual fantasies are. Now, as a blanket policy, I wouldn't be completely opposed to discussing my sexual tastes. Sometimes when I work with photographers I have a good relationship with, the stuff we shoot is as a result of our shared sexual tastes. I'm really fine with it, but the power dynamic of this relationship was him saying, well, I might photograph you if you're really lucky. I was only 25, he was a lot older, he was the one with the money, he was the one with kind of all the power in the situation. So it didn't seem like a particularly appropriate thing to be asking me, especially since he was using it as a bargaining chip for me being allowed to be photographed by him at all. I thought, well, I'd like to try to equalise this situation. So I said, great, OK, tell me what your sexual fantasies are. Because I thought if he's willing to open up and be honest to me, then maybe, maybe I will. And he, I thought quite disingenuously, went, oh, yeah, my sexual fantasies are all about just creating art. And I thought, nonsense. Your sexual fantasies appear to be playing power games with young women and offering to take them to the theatre in return for you clicking your shutter at them. So I said that my sexual fantasy was strangulation and that was the end of that beautiful 
potential working relationship because I think he assumed I wanted to strangle him and that was the end of that. So actually, I think 25 year old me dealt with that really well. I'm glad she didn't tell him anything personal about herself. He didn't deserve it. I'm glad she gave him a disingenuous response because he was giving her disingenuity. I hope I would be similarly fierce today. <sighs> Shameless photographers finding reasons to get naked. So this guy, who I referenced in last month's video, he is a professional commercial photographer and he shoots beautiful work, absolutely non-sleazy, nice looking work, but he uses his photo shoots as an excuse to get naked in front of his model and behave variously inappropriately. So he'd never got naked with me previously, we'd worked together several times, but he had managed, now looking back, to engineer situations where he took his top off so that his arm could be in a shot, to take his top off so he could be in the background of a shot. And I'd not thought much of it. It wasn't very comfortable, but the pictures were appearing in national magazines and newspapers. I could see that hiring a male model is expensive. And since he was demonstrably getting commercial quality results that he was making money from, I suppose I justified it. But the last time I worked with him, he suddenly sprung on me on the day that he wanted to get completely naked and do pictures in flagrante kind of sex pictures with me, um, with both of us naked, which absolutely had never been discussed and I would never have consented to. So I said, I don't want you to get naked. I'm fine getting naked. I don't want my employer to get naked. I certainly don't want him to get naked when he's alone with me and he's not discussed it beforehand. And he had obviously planned it. So he said, oh, well, I, obviously I know you've got naked with male models. But yeah, I have because they're models and they're not my employer and I'm not alone with them. It's a completely different thing. And again, the power dynamic means that in a situation like that, I'm equal with the male model. If he does something inappropriate, I can complain. Whereas my employer getting naked and then embracing me is a completely different situation. The power dynamic is very much not in my favor in that situation. So I compromised and I shouldn't have. I said, well, if you keep your underwear on, we can do it. And that was quite a lot later in my career. And it's one of my biggest professional and personal regrets because he got pictures that he shouldn't have been able to get with me. He used those pictures to trap another model to letting him get naked later. And looking back, I can just see that his strategy was this gradual grooming process over a number of shoots. And I'm very angry with him. And I hope I'll eventually stop being angry with myself because I should have just walked out and said, for goodness sake, hire a male model or don't hire a male model, but you're not getting naked on a shoot where you're my employer. It's absolutely inappropriate. And you know that because if it had been appropriate, you'd have mentioned it before I came to your house. So I guess we're one all at the moment, aren't we? Like he won that one and I'm really annoyed. The power junkie. Again, this is a story from the very, very beginning of my career. And it was back when I was naive enough to go to castings. I realize now, I'm not going to, I just don't. Either you can give me work based on my portfolio, which you can see online, or you can book someone else. I'm not going to castings. But anyway, back then I was, and I went to this photographer's house for a casting for a job that sounded amazing. It would have been going to the Bahamas for a week for paid modeling work, and that sounded amazing to me. So he gave me dinner, which seemed like a nice thing, <laughs> and sat down at the table with me, and I waited for him to start eating. And he went, yes, good, you've passed the first test. I was checking your table manners. And I thought, oh God. In what professional scenario is this appropriate? It's not appropriate in any professional scenario. What are you doing? Dangling the idea of a job over someone and then trying to test their good manners because I put it to you that you've just demonstrated a remarkable lack of good manners yourself. So the evening progressed horrifically. After dinner, he said he'd like to do some test shots. It turned out he didn't have a camera. He just wanted to sit on his sofa while I posed for him, which felt very similar to doing some kind of weird lap dance. Bearing in mind, I wasn't even being paid for this. This was a casting and he hadn't even got a camera despite the fact he was purporting to be a photographer. Then he started talking very alarmingly about 
Oh well, I'm seeing various girls for this casting, and the one I choose, whoever it is, she'll have to turn into an absolute sex goddess every time I pick up the camera. Like, if you've got a camera. As soon as I shut the door to the villa, she has to become an absolute sex beast. And I thought, I mean, thank you for telling me how to do my job. I'm perfectly capable of behaving in a sexual way on camera. But the fact that you're dwelling on it like this makes me quite suspicious. It all sounds a little bit like you don't understand the difference between fantasy and reality. You don't understand the difference between getting a shot that looks sexy and having an experience that is sexy. So I quietly decided to myself, once I'd escaped from his house, that I wouldn't take the job. He phoned me the next week and he said, okay, so it's down to you and one other girl. You're almost got the job, but she's Eastern European. I think he was trying to tap into my xenophobia that I wouldn't want to be beaten by a foreigner. I do not care. I love Eastern European models generally. All the ones I know are fabulous. She's amazing and, and she's very slim. So I just don't know which of you I'm going to give the job to. And I thought, well, I think what you want me to do is go, oh, oh, please, please, I really need this job. I promise I'll be really sexy. I'll just turn into a sex beast as soon as you close the villa door. And what I said, and again, applause to 25 year old me, I think, I'm very glad. I said, well, it sounds like you should give it to her if she's so slim. And that was the end of that working relationship. So I think it's 2-1 at the moment. I feel like I don't think I could make a better, more disagreeable response now. The only thing I would do better now is that I wouldn't go to the casting in the first place. Well done, embryonic aerial. Another power junkie from early in my career was another big name fashion photographer. They always tell you that just so you'll know. And he wanted to drive me from London to his house on the south coast to photograph me. I was very, very new and I was very excited about it because I'd only be modelling maybe four weeks and a fashion photographer wanting me just seemed amazing. He wasn't paying me, by the way. This was one of the very few TFP shoots that I did early on in my career. And on the drive, we talked about many things. And he said, just as we were getting near to his house, well, I've not even decided if I'm going to photograph you yet. I don't photograph everyone who wants me. And I thought, well, at this point, I've been in your car for an hour and three quarters. I've given up a day of my time. Actually, yes, mate, you are going to photograph me because that's the deal. That's like me saying, oh, I might not model for you today. I might just get to your house and lie there like a plank for eight hours. I thought you're just playing power games. Clearly what you want me to do is say, oh, oh, please, I'll give you everything. I'll completely commit to the project. I'll do the best modeling you've ever seen. And I come from a profession as an actor where there are great imbalances of power, as I guess we've seen with the Harvey Weinstein stories and all the similar allegations that have come out of late. I come from an industry where there are thousands, hundreds and thousands of young actors wanting work and the producers and directors have so much power because even if they're not paying, there'll be hundreds, thousands of people who want their job. So I came from a profession where I was one of those hundreds and thousands of young drama school graduates, all fairly good looking, all healthy, all ambitious, all well qualified. And I guess I found myself when I moved into the modeling world, I wasn't one of hundreds and thousands anymore. I was unique in that I was a six foot two, ex-classical ballet trained, classical theatre trained, kinky model. And I guess I'm very grateful to see, looking back, that I did realise quite early on that I didn't need to put up with the same nonsense that I'd experienced from casting directors when I was an actor. I didn't need to put up with that as a model because actually, if you have some skills, you look okay and you're prepared to work naked. Actually, there aren't thousands of people leaping to do every job and I'm glad that I realised that. So I said to him, well, yeah, I haven't decided if I'm gonna model for you or not yet. And I hoped it just redressed the balance that, you know, we can both spend the day playing power games and being dicks, or we can collaborate, which is what TFP is about. We can produce some nice images and we can see where we go from there. And that's what we did. So again, I'm gonna say I won that one. I hope I would be so assertive now because that was an absurd thing to say. And again, you've got a young model in your car, you've driven her to an area you know and she doesn't know, 
what are you doing trying to play even more power games? You're already the one in power, and I don't think you should abuse that by being an idiot. Being the big name. I was working with a photographer in the desert. He was a big name fashion photographer. As they all are, obviously. All of them. And actually, we had a perfectly pleasant day shooting perfectly pleasant pictures. But that evening, for sunset, he had organised doing a short workshop with some photographers who wanted to see him at work. And this is where he became completely shameless. I'd spent six hours with him by this point and I knew what his working style was when we were one to one. And as soon as he had three photographers watching him, he had a complete personality change. It's like he started trying to do an impression of what a big photographer would do. And he started shouting at me. He started shouting, impress me. Come on, give me your best pose. Impress me. And I'm afraid I just found it really funny. It made me want to do an impression of a top fashion model. And I don't know what, start snorting coke off the Joshua Tree cactuses. I don't know. Just absurd. If you're taking decent pictures, you don't need to role play like you can do your job. You are doing your job. You don't need to do an impression of it. It was the weirdest and most shameless thing. And I think the thing I found most offensive about it was that I assume he thought I wouldn't notice that he suddenly started behaving in a completely different way because he got an audience. It was remarkable. But I didn't do anything about it. I just carried on posing as normal and I kind of regret that now. I wish I'd said, why are you suddenly shouting? That would have been more disagreeable. This is the habitual liar. I had a photographer, probably about five years ago, who contacted me. He was an amateur photographer, he was relatively new to it, and I was quite sympathetic towards him because he was kinky and he wanted to shoot BDSM pictures, which is great. That's the field that I'm most interested in, it's the field I specialise in, and so I always welcome those photographers because I hope they're going to become part of my kinky family. He didn't. He approached the shoot in a relatively normal way. Maybe a little over attentive and over thorough, but often quite new photographers maybe do over plan this kind of thing because they're nervous and they've not done many shoots before. But then on the day, he dropped it on me that his pro dom, he called his mistress, his mistress had instructed him to wear women's clothes for the shoot. I don't have anything against anyone wearing anything. It's not a problem in itself, but I do think if you're going to do something that's slightly out of the ordinary, it's the sort of thing you should discuss beforehand. You shouldn't spring it on a model because sadly many models will have had experiences of photographers behaving in a sexually inappropriate manner at shoots so anything out of the ordinary like wanting to wear women's clothes which for some people of course is a sexual experience it's not a very kind thing to throw at someone who is your employee for the day so I wasn't assertive enough in this situation. I should have just said, I don't care what your pro dom said. You have a relationship with her. This is nothing to do with me. It is not for her to give you tasks to do in front of me. I'm not a consenting party. But I didn't because I wanted to be kind and he was new to photography. I didn't want to kind of pull him up on behaving inappropriately when I thought he probably hadn't meant to. Now I'm firmly of the belief that this pro dom slash mistress didn't even exist. This was just what he wanted to do and he thought that by couching it in terms of oh my dom told me to, I as another sub would maybe be sympathetic. Which I guess I was and I shouldn't have been because it's not appropriate. It's not appropriate to bring your sex life into professional workplace. So then, having got away with that, he said that his mistress had told him he had to get pictures of himself tied up at the shoot. Again, completely inappropriate. We were shooting bondage, but it was meant to be me tied up. I'm not a photographer. I didn't want to take photographs of him tied up. I didn't want to tie him up. None of this was comfortable. But again, because it was three quarters of the way through the day, I caved in and said, okay. Whereupon he put on a corset upside down and it was just all so weird, I didn't say anything, so then I photographed him in an upside down corset wearing leather cuffs and it was ridiculous and I'm really embarrassed because he was just lying to get what he wanted and what he wanted was a session with a pro dom, I think. But booking a model is cheaper, so I think he was trying to convert a relatively cheap model into a relatively expensive pro dom without her consent, which is a long way from okay. He, in the end, I had to fire him as a client because on subsequent shoots, 
he started wearing a chastity device on his dick under his clothes, but obviously this was part of his sexual fantasy. So instead of just wearing it under his clothes and me being none the wiser, he had to keep talking about it, and then had the audacity to say it was for model safety. As though the only thing stopping you sexually assaulting random women is a cage on your dick. That is a very alarming idea. So, I didn't work with him anymore, I think that was the right decision, but looking back I wish I'd said it on the first shoot. I wish I'd said this is not appropriate, no you have to stay in normal clothes, and no I'm not going to tie you up, no I'm not going to photograph you because I'm a model and that's what you've engaged me to do today. Or had the balls to say, fine, that's fine, that's four times as much money. <laughs> I did neither of those things. I wasn't sufficiently fierce on the day because I like to think of the community of submissives and dominance as a kind of like a sisterhood and brotherhood. And I think sometimes that is to my detriment. So I thought if only he'd been honest, none of that would have happened. Which means that the next time a crossdresser contacted me and was honest, I was prepared to be very kindly disposed to him. I'm afraid this is another shameless bit of trying to find reasons to get naked. So, a photographer contacted me on Purpleport about seven years ago and said he'd like to photograph me uh, and would I mind if he dressed in women's clothes because he was a cross-dresser and I thought, like, good for him for being honest being upfront, saying it beforehand so if it was going to be a problem I could turn down the shoot. So I felt really kindly disposed to him and I said of course that's absolutely fine. If, if that's how you feel comfortable then it's, that's exactly what you should wear. And the first shoot indeed was pretty normal. He wore really appropriate clothes, he wore the sort of things that a woman who was a photographer might wear. He, he wasn't wearing a drag queen outfit, he was just in women's clothes. Looking back he did get fully naked to get changed and he did that in the studio in front of me, which isn't acceptable really, but I gave him the benefit of the doubt because I'm someone who's very comfortable naked. I wouldn't do it in front of an employee because, again, the power is in my hands if I'm employing them for the day and I don't think it's fair to then foist your naked body on them. But I could see that perhaps he just didn't see it that way perhaps if he just had a very relaxed attitude to nudity. So I, I think I was very naive, um, I just wanted to give him the benefit of the doubt. So at the second shoot I expected him to wear something similar and I hoped perhaps he'd turn up already dressed on that occasion so he didn't suddenly get naked. And I guess as I'm beginning to discover from looking back over these stories, escalation is a big part of predatory people's strategy. So on the first shoot he'd done one thing that had been somewhat inappropriate and everything else had been fine, but having found a model who'd been okay with him dressing as a woman, I guess he was just looking to escalate the situation until he was doing what he actually wanted. Because what he actually wanted, friends, appears to be that he wanted to wear a tiny lace thong which didn't cover either his cock or his balls, a baby doll nighty that was so short that it exposed his panties and therefore genitalia. And he wore that for our four hour shoot. So I spent four hours just trying to ignore the fact that really to all intents and purposes I was in a studio with a naked guy. Then he asked if he could lie on a bed and if I could kneel over him so he could photograph up. And I realised that that would have meant like basically sitting astride his cock, which I really wasn't okay with. So I said I could kneel next to him, and then he asked if I'd lie down and if he could sit astride me, which again is even less appropriate because then I'd have felt quite trapped. So I finished the shoot, I left and I never left him a reference and I never went back. And he's disappeared off the model portfolio sites now, but I should have given him a negative reference. Looking back, I felt stupid because I, of what I'd let him get away with on the first shoot, and I realise that that was possibly part of his strategy. And it's horrible to have to think so suspiciously, but sadly, I think that's probably fair. I think he was trying to engineer a situation where he could wear almost nothing or women's lingerie and have a model touch him. I, I can't really see any other interpretation of that behaviour and it's shameless and it's abysmal. <laughs> 
Oh God, I just call this the full Harvey Weinstein. Thank God it's not the full Harvey Weinstein, but I was doing, I did one shoot with this photographer and that was enough. He was an amateur spanking producer and he'd hired a camera operator, another model and an assistant, which gave me the impression it was going to be quite a professional outfit. Sadly, in the first break we took from shooting after about 20 minutes of getting footage, he tried to continue to spank me. And I explained that I'm a spanking model, I'm happy to be spanked on camera, but I don't do sessions. So if a camera isn't running and we're not producing something, you don't get to spank me. Again, the power dynamic just makes that really uncomfortable. And he just couldn't understand at all. And I think maybe the only way I could have perhaps made him understand it is by saying, look, do you think that Jennifer Lawrence, just because she has a sex scene in a movie, do you think then that the makeup artist is gonna try to like hump her leg in the trailer? Do you think the director's gonna like start grinding himself against her because, well, you did a sex scene today? The answer is no. There's a divide between cast and crew for a reason. And the reason is emotional comfort and physical safety. I didn't appreciate it at all. And that's all I have to say about that. Completely shameless, completely inappropriate. And I wrote to him after the event. I should have just left the shoot, but I wrote to him afterwards and explained why that was completely inappropriate and not something he should ever do with a model. I doubt he listened to me, but at least I think I did the right thing after the event, even though I didn't really manage to do the right thing during the event. And <laughs> almost finally, but I think it's worth mentioning, is financial shamelessness. This is something shameless photographers try on, especially with new models. Early on in my career, I agreed to a professional photographer who gave me a sob story about wanting to do a location trip for a week uh, to one of the Canary Islands to shoot beautiful images. But he, because he'd be paying for all the expenses of the shoot, he couldn't afford much for the model, who was going to be me. Now, at the time, I was very sympathetic because I was 25. The idea of spending my own money on flights to the Canary Islands and, a, and meals out and a car and a villa, I mean, that sounded incredibly expensive and horrible to me. And the idea that someone would spend all that and then pay me a fee as well seemed quite magical in itself. So I quoted him a low rate of £300 for the week, far too low. At the time I was charging £250 for the day, so I was barely getting more than my day rate for seven days of work. He tried to underpay me. He said, oh, I think we agreed £200, didn't we? And I had to say, no, we really didn't. And looking back, I don't think that was an honest mistake. I think that was him trying to get me lower. And then, in the intervening time between us agreeing to this and us going on the location trip, which I guess was a couple of months, he booked three other photographers to come with him to share the shoot, which meant suddenly, instead of working for one person, I was working for four people who were paying the grand total of £75 each for the privilege of working with me for a week. And that is immensely exploitative. It was exhausting. They wanted to shoot dawn every day. They wanted to shoot dusk every day. And then they wanted to shoot stuff in the middle of the day as well. So I was doing insanely long hours for a week for far less than minimum wage. Absolutely abysmal. And finally, so lonely. The shameless photographers who are so lonely. I was working with a bondage producer who I'd worked with before with absolutely no problems. But when I worked with him the first time, I was in a relationship. And when I went back, I'd just come out of a really horrible breakup. So I was in quite a vulnerable emotional state. And most people, thank God, are lovely to you who've just broken up with someone. I certainly try to be really kind to people who've just gone through a breakup. We all know what it's like, or almost all of us know. And I was in a bit of a fragile state. Perfectly happy to work, but it was very recent history. And so it came up in conversation that that had happened. Whereupon he told me this very sad story about how his wife had left him and he'd got four children. He was bringing them up on his own like a brave single dad. I guess in my vulnerable position, I felt really sorry for him because I felt like I knew a bit of what that would be like. Although I didn't have children, I had just been left to fend for myself in the world when I thought I had a life partner. So I was very sympathetic. And when he suggested playing BDSM together in the evening when the cameras weren't running, I didn't know really how to say no politely. It didn't seem kind and I wanted to be kind to this poor man who'd been left as a single father with four children. 
so we did. We did a kind of play session and I thought that's what I should be doing. I'm single now, I should be doing BDSM, even if it's with someone I don't really want to do it with. And it wasn't a fun session anyway. But then suddenly he went white like a sheet and said he'd somehow managed to phone home by mistake because his mobile phone had been in his pocket and his children had heard us playing bondage games. So his eldest son, who was maybe 18, called him back and said, we've all heard this. So he left in great confusion and I was left in the motel where I was staying, thinking, oh my God, Jesus, that's terrible. These poor children have lost their mother and now they've got their dad appearing to kidnap women. And so he's got to go home and explain that he's not actually a psychopath, he's just kinky. So very awkward, but the shoot continued. We were shooting all week together and the rest of the shoot was perfectly all right. When I got back to England though, I got an unexpected phone call from a woman I'd never heard of and it turned out that she was his fiance. It hadn't been his children who he'd phoned by mistake, it was his fiance who he'd called by mistake and he'd been lying to her ever since and saying it was just a shoot, but she was highly suspicious correctly, had found my number and had managed to track me down. So we had a very frank conversation about it. I said I would never speak to him again. I would not make any contact with him again. I would never work with him again. And I hoped sincerely that she would leave him rather than getting married to this man who was going to saddle her with four children and wasn't even going to be faithful to her. God. So that, I think, was particularly shameless and I never did work with him again and I never would and I told everyone as I will continue to tell everyone who I think I might be able to help if I think they're in any way at risk of coming into contact with any of these shameless photographers. So that was my top 10 shameless photographer experiences. I must say as I've been compiling the list over the last few days I found myself very fascinated in what other models top 10 shameless photographer experiences would be. I hope that as time has gone by, some of the people who behaved particularly shamelessly to me at the beginning of my career maybe will have been weeded out of the industry. I hope that without being an actual photographer, you wouldn't get into that situation. And so some of those things are situations that I hope a new model starting today just wouldn't get into. But some of these are fairly recent and some of these are people who are probably still in the industry in some description somewhere, even if I don't know who they're operating as anymore. I guess I would say a couple of things. One, to new and established models, watch out for the escalation, watch out for the grooming, watch out for people doing one small thing that makes you a bit uncomfortable on a first shoot. And if you do want to go back and work with them again, it's probably worth mentioning your discomfort in the email exchange before your second shoot, just to nip any of that kind of escalation in the bud. Because I think I've dealt historically quite well with photographers behaving abysmally out of nowhere, but when they've kind of crept up to their abysmalness, I've found it much harder to cope with. And I think that's probably quite a common experience for people dealing with sexual harassment and similar. And the other thing I'd say is just to comfort you, I've had a long career and the vast majority of my photographers are absolutely lovely. Many of my best friends these days are photographers. I married one of my photographers. This sort of story, I don't think it should taint our industry. These are the outliers and they are people who are using photography for their own abysmal reasons and this is not representative of what the photographers who book models are generally like. So I love all you lovely photographers who are not like this. Thank you for not being like this. Thank you for not abusing the fact that you can hire a woman who's often going to be quite a lot younger and poorer than you for a photo shoot. Thank you for most of you treating us with respect and dignity and courtesy and equality because that's how you create good work and that's how you create good friendships. So I love this industry, but Jesus, there are some shameless people around. Thank you, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope, especially if you're a model, I hope you found it instructive. I hope if you're a photographer who was considering doing any of those weird things, just don't, because you might find yourself the subject of a YouTube video. Thank you very much, I'll be back next month. Please join me, please like and subscribe. It really matters, it does. Thank you, I'm not very good at pushing people to do it, so please just do it without me asking. Thank you very much, even though I just asked. Don't make me shout. <laughs> Goodbye!